Welcome to the podcast, How to Be Well and Strong. I'm your host, Jacqueline Genova, and I'm excited to have you join me as I speak with some of the leading figures in the fields of wellness, integrative medicine, and mental health, as we discover what it truly means to be well and strong in both body and mind. Get ready to be empowered, inspired, and motivated about being an advocate for your own health. A terminal cancer diagnosis can be paralyzing. However, when Jane McClellan was diagnosed with a stage four cancer in 1999, she didn't freeze. Using her medical knowledge and researching heavily, Jane put together a cancer-starving formula using natural therapies, exercise, diet, and a unique cocktail of drugs that acted synergistically to kill even the toughest of cancers. In fact, Jane became one of the pioneers in discovering the use of off-label drugs for cancer, mapping the landscape of cancer metabolism in a new way for patients to understand. In today's episode, Jane shares how off-label and repurposed drugs can effectively starve cancer. Jane is truly incredible and continues to serve as an inspiration and source of encouragement for anyone facing a terminal cancer diagnosis. I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the show. It is truly an honor to have you here. On a personal note, you have been such an inspiration to me since I first discovered your work through reading your book, How to Starve Cancer, several years ago. And quite honestly, I just continue to be amazed at the incredible opportunities I've been given to be able to sit and chat with people like yourself, whom I've admired for so long. So I'm, I'm truly just very grateful for your time. Pleasure to be here. Jane, so the use of off-label drugs for treating cancer is finally gaining traction, yet you discovered it yourself in 2003. For listeners who have not heard your story, I'd love for you to share how you essentially found yourself in this space. Yeah, well, um, I think most people when they're diagnosed with cancer, they want to look at all the natural solutions that are out there. And that's what I did to start with. I mean, I was diagnosed in initially 94 with cervical cancer. And then my mum got diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in 96. So I was starting to look for her, trying to save her life. And I know that your mum has also got um, stage four breast cancer. So I've been in your shoes, right? It's, it's tough. It really is tough because, you know, it's it's it's, it's really difficult to... to um, try and alter somebody else's protocol or try and influence them. And my mum was quite resistant, to be honest. I don't know what your mum's like, but my mum was quite resistant to doing anything um, against what the doctor was suggesting. So any dietary suggestion she thought was pretty much a waste of time. And possibly she was, you know, it it was pretty rapid, her decline. And I think she didn't tell us for a while. Um, I think she was trying to keep it a secret for, for quite some time. So she only told us. I think really towards the end. But anyway, I was looking for things for her and then she died. And then my cancer progressed to my lungs in 1999. And that's when I started to look at adding more and more things into my protocol. Um, And my friends called me maracas because I was like rattling with so many pills and things that I was taking. But so lots of natural supplements. And um, I, I would be looking at PubMed and Actually, I couldn't look at PubMed at that point. It was not online, I don't think. So um, I was looking in articles, reading many, many magazines, you know, the Townsend Letter, Life Extension. I was getting as many an, an, an actual, you know, um, journals from the hospitals to read. Really tough back then, you know, no uh, Facebook stuff like that. So really, I was sticking very much to the natural stuff. I had integrative doctors who I would quiz. I had a brilliant one called Dr. Calibou, sadly no longer around, but he had done, he'd traveled around the whole world. He'd investigated so many things. He was like my guru. And every time I was stuck in something or couldn't work out what to do, I'd run off to him and and we'd have little discussions. And he was like a big teddy bear to me. <laughs> as a doctor, he was, he was terrific. Um, and I had Dr. Kenyon as well, who was also great. So I was getting a mixture of intravenous vitamin C from Dr. Kenyon, my kind of nutrition and supplements I'd get from Dr. Calibre. I was 
out there. I couldn't just get, you know, I wanted as many sources of information as possible. And we know that knowledge is power. And the people I see do particularly well with my protocols are the ones who do the most research and really understand how their cancer is is progressing, what's driving it, you know, what's fueling it. Is it just estrogen? Is it glucose? Is it glutamine? Is it the fat? You know, there, there are all these things you need to take into consideration. And I didn't really, I knew that glucose was a big factor back then. So we're talking like 1999 was when I got my stage four. Um, and I was doing a very low glycemic diet and uh, I cut out meat as well. So I wasn't entirely, I was vegan for a while. And then I started adding a little bit of meat back in. Um, and then in 2003, I thought I was doing okay. So my markers for my first cancer, my cervical cancer were fine. I was keeping them in normal range, but um, I suddenly started feeling unbelievably tired, massive night sweats, which I knew weren't down to hormonal problems. I was actually uh, on HRT at this point. So it wasn't anything to do that. It was um, something called myelodysplasia because of course I had huge doses of chemo and radiotherapy. My oncologist did say, I might kill you with all of this. And I think she probably nearly did. But anyway, I managed to get through the treatments. Um, but then this then um, killed my bone marrow. And I think secondary issues as a result of high dose chemo and high dose radiotherapy will probably become more prominent in the future as people are being kept alive on some of these newer treatments. Then you'll see some of these problems with the bone marrow come through uh with more people in the future anyway so i then ended up with this and this was like a nobody knows how to treat this when you when it's treatment related so if you have leukemias or something like that and they just arise as, as problems in the bone marrow not from treatment then you can give treatment <laughs> of course i'd had the chemo i'd had the radiotherapy there was you know i couldn't treat with those two things and to be honest i just wanted to go a different route. And I looked at the natural and whatever I was doing on the natural side clearly wasn't enough. Um, so at this point, I thought I'm going to have to try something different. And I kept various articles through the, you know, over this time, I'd, I'd kept little articles that I, you know, I had a folder of stuff to sort of keep up my sleeve. If things get worse, I'll open the folder. And in this folder, I had some information about diprimol which is an antiplatelet drug, all right? And back in the 80s, they were showing that it had quite good anti-cancer effects for melanoma. Um, and uh, and I thought, well, it's, it's working on the blood as well. It's antiplatelets, probably reducing all of the uh, growth factors in the, in the blood. So I thought, right, I'm going to ask Dr. Calibu to prescribe it. And he'd never done that before. He looked at the research. He looked at I showed him the article and stuff, and he said, yeah, okay, you know, you're stage four. And again, it's looking at the benefit risk. The the um, risk of taking it, there are very few, you know, it's low toxicity, very few side effects. It's not like taking chemo or taking, you know, uh, any of these newer drugs. Uh, so, yeah, put me on it. Um, and uh, I was taking aspirin at that time as well. Dipridamol and aspirin are very synergistic. Uh, and actually, if you, if you have colorectal cancer, aspirin is meant to be quite good for colorectal cancer, but actually make it even better by adding dipridamol. They're synergistic. It was all about synergy. Yeah. Whatever I did, it was sort of looking at um, synergistic combinations. So I did that. And then I came across this article about a stronger non steroidal called etodilac, in combination, actually it was Sulindac that the uh, research article was about in combination with statin. In fact, Lovastatin seemed to be the, the best one at the time. Um, we've had other lipophilic fat-loving statins come out, which can also be used. But I used Lovastatin at quite a high dose, 80 milligrams, and I got uh, my oncologist to prescribe both of them, actually the Atodilac and the statin together, uh, and this was, again, something she'd never done. <laughs> so I was layering that on top of the dipridamol, uh, the aspirin. I had to be very careful about taking aspirin and this other non steroidal together because you can really mess up your, your gut. So um, I kind of started with the aspirin and then 
went on to the otolac and then I kept on the otolac for a while and then went back to the aspirin later but um so I, I was just layering these things in and some and one a lot of the natural stuff I was doing was very similar to some of the drugs so initially I was on a supplement called berberine well actually it wasn't even a supplement back then you couldn't get it berberine is now one of the hottest anti-cancer supplements you can get but I couldn't get it but I had seen research about berberine and oxyacanthine these two things that you can get um I got the full tincture of something called mahonia aquifolium that contains both of those things and they starve the glucose they also you know lots of lots of different factors anti-cancer effects and I was starting to get the picture that starving the cancer seemed to make a lot of sense um so you know I didn't the beauty of my cocktail I didn't fully realize until later on you know and there's been much more research coming out since about 2015 they've realized all of these metabolic pathways what drives it what feeds it what are the key things and what I've done in my book is try and work out what those key roots are and work out how to block them and I look back and go oh my god I blocked that and then I blocked this and and they of course they work in synergy you know and things like the statin and the dipridamol work on two similar cholesterol pathways but you know, every cancer cell needs to have little cholesterol blobs on the surface. And um, I, 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 most cancer cells upregulate or make sort of this pathway much more active. People get a bit funny about statins. Um, and certainly with cardiovascular disease, we're not talking about cardiovascular disease, we're talking about cancer, totally different. I say all the time, it's my endless battle with people just trying to persuade them to actually look at statins and add them in as part of the cocktail because they are seriously anti-cancer but in particular with the dipridamol and dipridamol for breast cancer it's like fantastic it um it works on the breast cancer resistance protein uh which is big and you know um and fat is a problem in some cancers like colorectal breast prostate in particular you know um they they really get quite driven by uh, a lot of fat so you actually have to reduce the type of you have to be very careful about the type of fat so if you're doing a ketogenic diet you really need to up those omega-3s like massively they need to be really um a, a major part of the diet and i don't think people realize that when these cancer cells are producing their daughter cells they are making new membranes and the membranes are made out of fat lipids. Okay, they're made out of fat. And if they can't get hold of the correct fat, omega-3s, they will make them out of fat from bad oils like corn or sunflower, whatever you're putting in your mouth, palm oil. Oh, so it'll make the um, cell membranes out of that. And this makes them more resistant to treatment. So if you want to make yourself more um, responsive, more sensitive to the treatments that you're getting, you need to up the omega-3s, okay? It's really important to get the right fats, critical. Just as critical as, I think, as lowering the um, the glucose levels as well. So, you know, look at both, look at both. Make sure that you're taking the right um, glucose-lowering supplements, the diet, and um, and metformin, is brilliant. I added metformin into my cocktail um, a bit later on, about 2007, I started adding metformin in, but I, it, I was already clear at that point. You know, it only took me a few months to get myself clear in about 2003 without doing any other massive intervention, but I didn't do it long enough. So I only did this cocktail for about three or four months because I didn't know. I was like my own guinea pig. I was at my own experiment. And I could see that my markers and my uh, blood markers were all dropping. They're all nearly normal again. So I tailed off and that was a big mistake. Um, and I don't think people stay on the cocktail long enough sometimes. I've seen it before where people think, oh, I'm doing well. I just come off the drugs. And, and why drop metformin? It's it's one of, you know, it's anti-aging. It helps stop gluconeogenesis, which is your body's attempt to replenish sugar um if you are doing a keto diet or you're doing intermittent fasting or you're pulsing into ketosis a little bit so what your liver will try and do is compensate for that and make turn your fat 
into sugar and metformin can help lower that as well. So it's it's a complementary drug that works really beneficially uh, in combination with the other things. So that was that was my approach. And bingo, I'm still here. <laughs> Um, many, many years later. And, you know, and I, I have to keep retelling my story and telling people this is why it worked, you know, but I didn't, uh, I, part of it was an educated guess because I had some medical training. I was a chartered physiotherapist. And, you know, I, I knew enough that I could go back and, and look through the literature and, and in my head work out the kind of things that I thought were really important. But when I started writing my book and that's when I started delving deep, deep, deep into some of these metabolic pathways. And that's when it really was, um, goodness, look what I really did, you know, and the way that, you know, it all worked together. It's like, wow, okay. And I I just find it deeply frustrating that people are too anti the drugs, you know, Um, and that they're not necessarily embracing all of this because they are low toxicity and they're not going to, you know, you've got to look at the risk benefit profile of what you're doing particularly if you're stage four um yeah it, you know we're, talking, we're in a completely different zone now and I can see it happening that even more doctors are even traditional doctors are starting to prescribe the metformin and the satin and maybe well you can't get hold of mavendazole um which is one of the drugs that uh this clinic the care oncology clinic prescribe um which helps block a lot of the glucose uptake um, but you know, there, there are many drugs that you can take, which will be so beneficial, uh, and people are scared of doing, I, I, I just take that step forward. You can check your liver markers. You can check things, how things are going on the way, you know, and, and if you really hate statins, you can pulse them. Don't take them all the time. I still take a statin at night, but not every night, you know, I, I, I pulse it. Um, you've got to understand that it has a different effect for cancer than it does for heart disease or anything else. And, you know, there's, there's so much anti-satin social media posts going on right now. It's I feel like I, I, I'm in a battlefield with some of the natural A battlefield, Jane, <laughs> is exactly how I would describe it. Right now, I shouldn't be. I'm just there talking about it. And yet I feel I'm up against so much resistance. Um, it's It's, I feel... You know, and I feel sad because I just know how much these patients would do better if they actually took that step and took some of these things. Um, And, you know, (laughs) I'll keep pushing until people actually start listening a little bit more. But really, really, it's worth, you know, the satin side effects have been so overblown, so overblown in the social media you know, oh, you're going to get dementia. Oh, you're going to get muscle aches and pains. You might get a few muscle aches and pains. That's actually a sign that it's probably working on the cancer. What you don't want is to have um, uh, this rhabdomyolysis, which is a far more serious but very rare thing. Um, and you can check that, you know, if you start um, peeing brown fluids, <laughs> definitely get yourself checked. But, you know, if you get a few aches and pains or a bit of spasm in it, in your arms and legs, don't worry about it too much. You know, if you're really worried about it, pulse it a little bit. Um, uh, occasionally take CoQ10 if you're really worried, but actually reducing CoQ10 is one of the reasons that the satins work for cancer. Different different tack. You truly are brilliant. And the fact that you essentially discovered all of this before it even came to light with research in 2015 just is a testament to that. And your book, How to Starve Cancer, I have pretty much every single page marked up, highlighted notes. For listeners, Jane created this metro map, which is basically a diagram that, you know, depicted your approach to starving cancer. And there's just so much to that. I will include the link for that in the show notes as well. But it's truly, you have to self-educate yourself. And that's clearly what you did. And, you know, you found something that worked. And, you know, uh, and patients who do that definitely uh, do so much better. And, it, you know, and the patient themselves have to do it rather than just the carer or whoever is looking after them. That the, the actual, you know, you get much better compliance from the patient. They're more likely to do the protocol or to look at, you know, adding these things in, in if they actually fully understand why it is they're doing it. So yeah, it's, um, 
it's hard from the from your perspective. I know what you're going through right now with um, you know, as a carer, and it's very hard, very hard. And everybody thinks all the pressure is on the cancer patient, but there isn't. There's a massive amount of pressure, you know, self induced pressure, to be honest, um, on the carer, particularly if you you know, and it's it's um, it can be very um, very hard for you too. So yeah. you know, be easy on yourself. <laughs> It's so challenging because you're just, I mean, similar to the battlefield analogy. I feel like I'm in that too, right? Just with all the different studies coming out and the people who are so strong and their opinions. And it's just, it's, it's so challenging to navigate. It is. And who's right? Who's wrong? Somebody will say, you know, you can have lots of fruit for breast cancer. I'm actually, if you look at the research, look up, and I just want to mention this because, um, fructose is the fruit uh, sugar, and that gets taken up by GLUT5. If anybody's worried about whether they should or can or can't take fructose, they need to have a look at the GLUT5 receptor to see whether that's uh, a problem. And with breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, there are quite a lot of cancers that will use the GLUT5, that fructose, and stimulate more uh, metastasis. So it is a potential problem. You can get around that by taking some lots of... Uh, parsley which is what chris walk does and also by taking the uh, the main supplement that um well the main ingredient of parsley that helps block the glute 5 is something called a pigeonin so that's something that people should maybe add in if they can't if they don't like celery or parsley it's it parsley is the one that has most um a pigeonin celery does a little bit as well but you should be uh, you should be supplementing with with this uh, a pigeon in as well. Interesting. Yeah, I'm. I know. I mean, even with my mom too. I'm always like, stay away from very high fructose fruits. For example, like oh. mangoes, watermelon. Yeah. Right. Opt for like blueberries, a handful of blueberries instead. So definitely blueberries are fine. Yeah, yeah. definitely substitutes yeah. there. Um, but going back to your story, Jane. So you obviously had the support of your doctor in prescribing these medications for you, which thank God for yeah. her, you wouldn't be here wow. right now telling thank your God. story. That wasn't luck. You know, I chose that. I binned one of my other oncologists. And you have to be very careful about your team, who you choose to get on your team. And even if you can't find the right person, you've got to find somebody else who will work with you so they can compensate for the problems that you get with some of the other people on your team, you know, and you always need to get, opinions options yes. options are what people want when you're stage four you want options and you want people who understand the potential options that are out there because there are many more than people realize you know and things like uh, and and how to make your radiotherapy and your chemotherapy work better things like hypothermia can work better and there are some really good treatments there's a new laser photodynamic therapy machine which i'm definitely going to get when i when i'm trying to um raise some money in and get a clinic in the UK. Um, and that's definitely, you know, hypothermia, photodynamic therapy will absolutely be in my clinic. But there are many things that you need to have in order to get a better result. And just, just we are so below where we should be with our cancer treatments in terms of integrative approaches and actually encouraging people to do more, look around, find out other things that can really assist you know, I mean, it's, um, we're like 20 years behind still the treatments and the possibilities of adding some of these things are there and people aren't doing them because they just don't know about them. It's, it's to me, that's, um, it's very sad. I couldn't agree more. And also to Jane, you touched on this before, but how do we balance taking care or not we, but how do patients balance taking care of their gut microbiomes, which we know consists of 70% or more of our immune system, right? With some of these off-label yeah. drugs. So for example, my mom's been taking doxycycline and that in its nature is an antibiotic, right? Which we know can compromise our intestinal flora. Yeah. So how do you, how do you yeah. balance that? Um, well, if you are on an, an immunotherapy, you don't want to be taking doxycycline at all. Um, so that's not one that I would recommend. There are alternatives to doxycycline because doxy works on blocking two key pathways, fatty acid oxidation and the oxfos. 
you can block those with some other things. So Dan Chen, which is a natural alternative for blocking uh, fatty acid oxidation. And with Oxfos, the metformin, you know, so um, yes, they're great. But, you know, that's not the only reason that doxycycline works. It blocks something called another pathway called MMPs, which are growth factors. Um, and that's really key as well. And it depends, you know, with your gut, you, um, doxycycline gets taken up more in the small intestine than the large intestine. The large intestine is where your true sort of gut microbiome is is seated. You shouldn't have all of these um, uh, problems going on in your small intestine unless you've got SIBO. So it's it's all about um, looking at the whole spectrum of, of what's going on in your gut. But Doxy, if you pulse it, um, don't take it for too long. You can replenish the good stuff in your gut at the same time. There is a yeast which won't get wiped out and is really important called Saccharomyces boulardii. All right. And that you can take alongside the Doxy at the same time. It's not going to get affected by the Doxy and really good for you. And the other thing is to maybe take um, the Doxy either late at night or first thing in the morning and then take probiotics the other end of the day. So you're kind of spacing it out. So you're just trying to replenish a little bit. Don't take them at the same time um, is all I'd say. Otherwise, you're just wasting the probiotics. They won't have much of an effect. And I know you're a big advocate of a combination approach, right? It's not just one thing that will destroy the cancer. It's many things working synergistically. Yeah. So in addition, Jane, to the off-label drugs, what other complementary therapies are you a fan of? I mean, I've seen research that Doxy, for example, coupled with high-dose IVC is incredibly powerful at killing cancer stem cells. So are there other therapies to, you know, couple with this off-label or repurposed drug approach like mistletoe therapy? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so my big push at the moment is something called ferroptosis. And that's something I wrote about in my second edition. I've got a whole new chapter, another 80 pages in my in my book. So I've updated my book to add that in. Um, and that's using cancer's love of iron. It's not necessarily adding more iron because you don't want to do that necessarily. You can stimulate um, progression by adding iron. But you, you use what cancer has got, the iron that it has got. You liberate the iron and then you have pro-oxidative uh, therapies like intravenous vitamin C, for example. So that's, you know, I'm, I I used it. And looking back, I may have actually done some ferroptosis. I didn't realize at the time because nobody even knew what ferroptosis was until 2012. Um, so this is a new way of, it's not a new way. It's been around forever. <laughs> People didn't actually have a name for it or didn't even know it existed. But this is a different way of simulating cancer cell death using iron. And you just oxidize the um, the iron, but you have to do it in a particular way. And again, resistance pathways. It's like my Metro map is all about resistance pathways. Ferroptosis has resistance pathways. Um, and there are key things you need to add in order to make it work. So um, statins, again, really good for ferroptosis because they lower the CoQ10. But um, so that it's it's all about sort of antioxidants versus pro-oxidants. Um, and CoQ10 is a very antioxidant um, element. And so that will actually stop the ferroptosis happening in the, in the cancer. So it's a matter of taking a cocktail um, that works synergistically to, ki to kill the cancer. And I think ferroptosis, particularly when you are stage four and you are resistant to other treatments, it works brilliantly because photodynamic therapy is another pro-oxidant approach. So it's releasing oxygen into the environment into the tumor environment, same way that um, intravenous vitamin C does. They work synergistically together. You can eradicate tumors much better if you get a really good synergistic combination. Ferroptosis works like a kind of Mexican wave through the tumor. So it starts off one end and sort of sweeps through the tumor to sort of kill it off. That's how it works. Um, but you have to stimulate it, get it to work in the right way. And that's something I shall be pushing to do a lot more of in my clinic, uh, my clinic, I'm 
keep saying it, it'll happen. It will. Well, Jane, I know we are pressed for time. So I will be including all of the links for listeners to find you to your books, all of that in the show notes section. But my last question for you is what does being well and strong mean to you? Well and strong. Wow. Just having the energy to to go out there and enjoy life. I mean, it's there. Let's go and take it, you know, instead of being uh, the one of the problems with cancer is you get this fatigue um, and it hits you very badly in some cancers in particular. And it it's actually after chemo and these treatments that you, you get worse. And I, you know, why is that? Do we have a co-infection of other things going on? And the chemo actually makes it worse, makes these other bugs worse in us and, and drains us? Or is it, how does it, how does that work? How do we get so much chronic fatigue with cancer? Something I want to answer. I want to dig in to try and get the truth. But certainly, um, you know, it was something that affected me for a long time. Um, but yeah, having the energy to get up and enjoy every moment of life is, is key, really key. Beautiful. Jane, well, thank you for your time. Thank you for all of the work that you do in this space. It truly was an honor to speak with you and I hope to have you on again soon. Yeah. And good luck with your mum. Thank you, Jane. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to support the show, please subscribe, leave a rating and review and share it with others. Be sure to visit wellandstrong.com to access notes from the show and to stay current with new content. I'm so grateful you joined me. Be well and be strong.